Let the word go The forward. challenge, the opportunity to connect. The 1960s, a time of imagination and change, a time of anger and fear. The 1960s is a pioneering program called Challenge. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. That looked at our connections, our divisions, through the lens of shared values. Sixty years later, we examine our divisions, our connections, our shared pains and successes in a new program called Challenge 2.0. The Hamas attack in Israel and the counterattack by Israeli Defense Forces in Gaza have led to thousands of civilian casualties. It is a human tragedy of inconceivable scale and impact, and it gets worse each week. In this episode of Challenge 2.0, we'll seek to move beyond the political, historical, and military aspects to focus on the human cost. We're going to continue our conversation with two caregivers who have deep frontline experience in this region, gained while seeking to alleviate human pain, suffering, and need. They have performed their work at great personal risk. So this week, part two of Volunteers in Hell. So as we began to discuss last week, uh, this very upsetting, situation, uh, this lethal situation that's going on in the Middle East, uh, it's useful to have some people that have been there to give us a sense of what they've experienced and perhaps give us a sense of is there an out other than nothing but bloodshed. And we have two people that I think are ideally suited to helping share those experiences. <laughs> Dan O'Neill, who is a founder of Mercy Corps, and Christy Yick, who is a RN, a registered nurse, and has mm -hmm. served on numerous medical teams, both in the Middle East and, if I'm correct, elsewhere uh, as well. Let's begin by just asking, whatever drew you <laughs> into this work in the first place? Uh, I have to suggest, I have to suspect there are family members of both of you that are looking at mm -hmm. your volunteering and going to these various places and saying, Dan, Christy, <laughs> you really need to do this, not only to yourself, but to <laughs> us. I mean, uh, what did draw you in that direction? And what sort of family mm -hmm. uh, reaction have you had, Christy? Uh, yeah, I mean, my parents are huge supporters of me doing work. They raised us in such a way that, you know, all lives um, have value. We're all mm -hmm. brothers and sisters, children of God. And, um, you know, do good where you can, whether it's mm -hmm. locally or away at a church, community school. So I was very fortunate that my parents have always been very supportive. Um, uh, I think I got involved, you know, you just hear about tragedy or oppression. Mm -hmm. And if you feel like you can help in some way, then uh, I think by human nature, we're compelled to help for the mm -hmm. most part. And I was fortunate enough to work with a pediatric general surgeon who herself had been over numerous times to um, uh, Palestine, uh, West Bank and Gaza and mm -hmm. done medical missions. And when I heard that she was doing it and I knew her, I reached out and, and asked, invited myself if I could go along, if she would have a need for another nurse over there. And she said, absolutely. So it didn't uh, take her long to accept your Yeah, so Yeah, um, and she herself was involved with um, PCRF, which is the Palestinian Children's Relief Foundation. Mm -hmm. And they do work directly in um, Palestine, West Bank, and Gaza. And that's run by uh, Steve Sosabi, the president, for over 30 years. And Dan, go down a list of the places you've been for Mercy Corps, and you get a pretty lengthy list of all the trouble spots. Uh, what drew you into that? The initial impetus was being in a very major war mm -hmm. 50 years ago, which took place on Yom Kippur, which is the, also the anniversary that was the excuse for the attack against the Israeli kibbutzim mm -hmm. on October 7th. But that war shook me up. I mean, I, you know, I, I suffered some injuries. Um, I was threatened with, uh, you know, live fire from different directions. And it forced me to think in terms of, you know, the finite around me and how long can I do this? Mm -hmm. And what's the answer to this, basically? And I, I just felt like, I mean, as a person of faith, I've been on a pilgrimage towards something. And that has been fueled by, uh, you know, uh, the social teaching of the church mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the gospel, if you will, that compels us to reach out even to our enemies. Mm -hmm. So my, my, my track was, I was a graphic designer and an artist and an art director and photographer and, 
And I had, uh, you know, I actually photographed that war. Some of those shots ended up in the Seattle Times. Uh, but I, I began to, to rotate toward uh, the, the horizon out there that was something different. Mm -hmm. It was not focusing on the problems and the catastrophe, but focusing on well, what could be. What could we do to be part of the answer instead of part of the problem? Mm -hmm. So I thought about that, and it was, you know, years later uh, that I made the decision to start an organization because of the Cambodia ref refugee catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And Rosalind Carter generously helped me and invited me and my people to the White House, and she lit the fire under the media, and that launched Mercy Corps in 1979. Mm -hmm. So I'm maybe I'm off topic, but. Um, I think I was raised like Christy in a family that was, you know, you should love one another and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Mm -hmm. And there's also the incarnational witness, like Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. If you have a minute. I was going to say, please expand on that just a little bit. Well, she's been one of my heroes. I have a personal note from her, which mm -hmm. is classified as a second degree relic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I touch it and I hope I'm glowing in the dark, right? <laughs> But she, I was in Lebanon during the October, or the 1982 invasion of the Israelis called Peace for Galilee, mm -hmm. which of course the Lebanese called it a catastrophe for them. Mm -hmm. But I, I was in the initial uh, aerial bombardment in a hotel right next to their targeting area, and so that mm -hmm. became kind of, and so I followed that war and we did some work in some refugee camps. Um, and as the war, drug on over time, the, the catastrophic impact on the general population and even the government was apparent to everyone. And Mother Teresa pointed out a hospital where there were disabled children mm -hmm. and that that should be an example of us reaching out to them, not, not killing everybody. Mm -hmm. And so she had the um, commitment and, uh, to go, she went by herself uh, into Beirut, and she told everybody, the warring parties, the Israeli IDF down in the south, and the PLO, and the Marabi Tune, and the Phalangists on the, on the north, and she said, I'm gonna go get these kids. Mm -hmm. And so, wh who was gonna stop her? And I watched on live TV as she walked across a big square, mm -hmm. and all the shooting stopped. And she got these kids, 20 or 30 of them. I mean, you can Google this in New York Times because mm -hmm. it's in there. And she brought them out and put them in buses and the shooting stopped. And so I recently wrote a note to the arch, new Archbishop of Las Vegas, who's a very dear friend, George Thomas, mm -hmm. Archbishop uh, George uh, Thomas. Um, and I suggested that, well, if ever there was a time for the Pope to go to Jerusalem and quote unquote stop the shooting, mm -hmm. now is it. And that means East Jerusalem that the Palestinians claim as their own, mm -hmm. and then West Jerusalem, which is completely Israeli run. But you know, whether that'll trickle its way up to the Vatican or not, I don't know. But I like to light fuses and see if something goes off at the end, you know. Well, we have to note that this program has its foundation uh, in a rabbi, Raphael Levine, yes. and Father William Tracy, and they founded a camp called Camp Brotherhood. Yes. And they actually brought young people over from Israel and Palestine mm -hmm. and showed how they could get together. Yep. But of course, that's where we want to go, and we're going to talk more about that, but we need to face where we're at right now. And Christy, I wonder if you could share uh, some of your experience of doing or attempting to perform medical work uh, over in Gaza, uh, just anticipating it must have been at least at times a nightmare situation. Mm -hmm. can, you, mm -hmm. can you describe some of the situations you've been through over there? Yeah, um, I was lucky enough to go with you know some experienced people who had been before, mm -hmm. so they were able to mentally prepare us for what we were gonna see. Um, I don't think I was prepared for uh, just the the destruction that was already present mm -hmm. in Gaza. I was expecting to see, you know, like poverty and poor people mm -hmm. and like, almost like you see on TV, but I wasn't expecting to see the lack of humanitarian um, care for the, the people there. 
um, we didn't necessarily know who we were going to, you know, like what kind of patient. We knew they were going to be children, but they would come to us. They would hear like there's a general surgeon, pediatric surgeon coming, and so they would bring their children who um, perhaps could be helped. And mm -hmm. They do have very educated doctors over there, but they lack supplies. So we would try and bring whatever we could over, mm -hmm. and then we would work with them as a team. So it wasn't like us coming in and necessarily um, taking the patients from them. It was a collaborative work, mm -hmm. which was beautiful. So I worked mm -hmm. side by side with their nurses. And the children that we saw were very malnourished, um, lacked just everyday uh, like clean water mm -hmm. treatments. So, so a lot of them did need surgical intervention, but a lot of them just needed um, clean water, things that we couldn't even bring over. Mm -hmm. That was traumatic to see. Mm -hmm. um, it just opened my eyes to what was going on over there, that this oppression, this was it like you'd go into the surgical suite or wherever you performed that, uh, and then you were able to continue uninterrupted, or did you have other distractions that you were dealing with? Definitely um, hurdles, distractions. Um, you know, everything is controlled by, you know, fuel, power, you mm -hmm. know. Um, they don't get any uh, new supplies over there, so like autoclaves to sterilize things are limited. They break down. They can't get parts for them. They operate with limited supplies. so. Getting, making the equipment <coughs> sterile to do the surgeries. Mm -hmm. Everything was kind of MacGyvered together, yeah. makeshift. It was shocking to see. I felt like I had gone back hundreds of years, you know. Luckily, they have anesthesia, but everything was limited, and it was tapping back into sometimes, you know, a medicine before we had modern technology, you know, monitoring their oximetry, oxygen flow, and just things like that. Um, getting pain medication, things, supplies, you know, you, you're just conditioned to asking for something and then you realize, oh, we don't have that. Well, like, how can we, with what you have here, how can we create that, build mm -hmm. that, put it together? How can yeah. we make use of it? Um, and then often during surgery, the power would go out, which I wasn't prepared for that. So electricity, they'd say, well, it's controlled by the Israeli side. So things I hadn't even thought about. And I'm like, well, how long will we sit here in the dark? And they said, until they decide to turn it back on. And they do have generators, but again, everything is so... But then the fuel is an issue. Yeah, everything's just old and slow. So, you know, when we have power outages in, in Seattle at our hospitals mm -hmm. and the wind blows it out, the generator goes on within seconds. And even that brief interruption is pause for concern. Like, is everything still running? Is everything mm -hmm. plugged into the appropriate outlet? Are ventilators still going? Are the, you know, cardiac monitors? or the neonatal incubators still going. But when there, it would go out for minutes, which seemed like hours. Mm -hmm. And you just you just stop during surgery because you have small children that their abdomens, their stomachs are open, so you just don't move. Right. And you're like, wow, yeah. this is scary. Yeah. And there were some attacks that you experienced as yes. well, some yeah. military operations. Yeah, you know. Uh, the retaliation, so true, um, the Hamas fires rockets, which the Iron Dome on the Israeli side intercepts those rockets. And then every once in a while, a, a missile or rocket will get passed. But then what's to come, the retaliation, mm -hmm. is that stirred so much fear, right? Everybody's like to the basements and um, the bombs are dropping. And you know, can they bomb the hospitals? And they say, well, due to international law, they're not supposed to, but we can't guarantee, yeah. but we should be protected. Um, there was one night we had been operating probably at least 14 hours and we had dropped off the last child in the ICU, the neonatal ICU. And then we were told, you know, to get to the dormitory, which is right next to the hospital. Mm -hmm. They told us to run this stretch. And I was like, run? And they're like, well, they're dropping bombs and we don't know where they're landing. I was like, okay, and they said, and when you get there, we want you to open up all the windows and the sliding doors because the blast, even though if it's far away, it'll shatter the... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wasn't prepared for that. I mean, obviously, I knew bombings go on, but I didn't realize it was that close to the mm -hmm. humanitarian work and 
the hospitals and the civilians. Mm -hmm. And they were scared, but they, they would repeat over, we're, we're used to this, this is our life. You, you pray, pray that nobody hits us. So we did, we ran over and we were opening a slider and we saw people running for their lives essentially and sirens going off. And then a bomb had dropped, I don't know how many miles away, maybe not even the miles. And the blast was so intense that my colleague and I, f we flew backwards off our feet and hit the wall that was a couple feet behind us. And then our coworkers came back from the hospital and it was us all scrambling to the basement mm -hmm. where we stayed for hours. And then of course you sleep that night with the doors open. For days we slept till we could get permission by Israel to then leave, let mm -hmm. humanitarians out. It was horrifying, and then drones everywhere, and feeling of being watched. And of course, we know, and you've shared some pictures, which we're showing or will show. Uh, conditions are far, far worse right now. Uh, you've talked to some of your colleagues over there that you've worked with. Uh, what have they shared with you? And then I guess the question I'd follow up on that with both of you, because Dan, you've been in these situations, is what does that do in terms of the level of stress and their ability to function in those situations? Even before this um, intense bombing broke out, I had been in contact with colleagues in Gaza. We communicate through WhatsApp, so mm -hmm. every once in a while we would reach out or just say a quick hello. Um, but when this was going on, of course, our whole team that was over there, we reached out and said, are you okay? Are you alive? So every day it's like a daily check-in to see who's still there and what the conditions are. Um, when they started letting a little bit of humanitarian aid in, we would ask, um, is it reaching you? Uh, they are at the European Gaza Hospital. Um, and they would say, no, not yet, not yet. Um, because it seems like they had so many people evacuate to the south, mm -hmm. but then there are healthcare workers and families that for whatever reason cannot, whether they're staying with the patients and taking care of them or people are too old or too sick or mm -hmm. unable to move. Um, so they are in a way up there. They always say too, you know, we are not supportive of this Hamas attack and retaliation but we cannot leave, you have to understand. Mm -hmm. um, I saw, I mean, I've watched it from the beginning of our conversation since October 7th from going from being afraid to sad to angry. Like, why is the world not aware of what's going on? Mm -hmm. Why is nobody helping us? Um, then they get seem to get strong again. We will not um, abandon our people. We will mm -hmm. fight fighting in the sense that we will fight to stay alive, not fight the IDF. None of them have ever expressed any words of hate or hostility to them. They've tried to remain um, impressively hopeful and uh, they just pray, that's it. And they hope for peace, that's what. We hope for peace, we hope for freedom. That's what they just keep reiterating, peace and freedom. Dan, I might ask you the added twist on that is what are the uh, levels of stress short term? Do they ever shed that or are we talking about long term psychological impact? Uh, I think it's both. Mm -hmm. You know, we have people in their 80s and 90s that are still grappling with what we used to be called shell shock. Mm -hmm. It was just PTSD. Mm -hmm. We, now that we know that, and trauma persists inter, you know, generationally, and so um, there's no end to it unless it, it, until some authentic peace kicks mm -hmm. in. I, what's gonna come out of this, among other things, war, crime, war, war crimes are gonna be charged, mm -hmm. investigations are gonna start. I mean, that's clear. But then the, the, the uh, sort of massive population that's traumatized Will, will persist over time, mm -hmm. and then some will be radicalized. In other words, they're gonna create more terrorists this mm -hmm. way, I mean, watch. Yeah. 20 years from now, these 12-year-olds are gonna be carrying AK-47s. Mm -hmm. So you have all the detritus and shrapnel of this event being magnified, 
in concentric circles of, of impact, mm -hmm. how do you stop that? Well, there's people like, you know, our nurse person here, Christy, that can help stave off and provide and ameliorate some of the pain, but overall it's gonna take society to reach an authentic peace, and then the experts, trauma experts, are gonna be, I think internationally, they're gonna be coming to the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, is there any reason for hope that we'll get out of this cycle? You always have to have hope. I think that's the goal. Maybe it's unattainable in the short term in some ways, but without, without hope, I wouldn't be able to do any of the stuff mm -hmm. that you know I've, I've been able to do. And I think you know, without hope, then there's despair, and despair is gonna lead to societal depression in mm -hmm. mass, and it's gonna lead to trauma. And the hopelessness just saps the creative energy out of any population. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go to countries where there was a genocide taking place, like Rwanda. And you've been there. Uh, yeah, I was there. Uh, or Cambodia, and, and following hostilities, you just sense this uh, huge pall, this cloud of uncertainty and trauma, and what about how are we going to live, and what about our relatives, and it's just day to day sinking into the hole, whereas I think hope is an elevated vision that that can be provided through people who are just authentically humanitarian in nature and nonpartisan. But you've mentioned there are some groups yeah, there are. that bring people together from both sides. Yes, can you I, tell us a little bit more well, about I, that? Well, did I mention about the family circle? Mm. Uh, the, it's a group of uh, traumatized victims who have lost their children or relatives to terror. Mm -hmm. Both Israelis who have lost their kids and then Palestinians who have lost their kids and their and they meet together and they're called the Family Circle. It's a little nonprofit organization. I met their leaders in uh, uh, Jerusalem in 2011. They're still mm -hmm. going, and they they put their hearts on the table to express how they really feel, mm -hmm. and the the horror and the grief of their loss. And and then then the their opposite, like the Israeli, will say, "Well, that happened to me too." Yeah. So the shared trauma becomes a point of uh, sort of hope, I think. Uh, how could people watching this or listening to us mm -hmm. be of some assistance or have some impact on this? Yeah, I mean, I encourage people to do their own research and, and get a little bit more about the history, but then also get to know each other, right? You know, like you said, share coffee. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so many words are being thrown out, Islamophobe, anti-Semitic. And really, we are just human beings, mm -hmm. you know, living, surviving, uh, coexisting. And um, the more that we get to know each other and understand that we all come from the same place. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants what's best for their family, their loved ones. I don't think anyone wants sorrow, suffering, no. war, and that we all have that capability and um, just to listen to each other, mm -hmm. be compassionate. Just and groups down. such as the group that you went over yeah, with? Yeah, PCRF, there's ways to donate to them. Okay. Um, there'll be ways, they'll need people to help to rebuild. Um, and then, like I said, emotional support. So I think identifying with the other, right, mm -hmm. until the other ceases to become the other, and it's more of a oneness. Mm -hmm. Any reaction uh, to those that are using this as a reason to express anti-Semitism and attack synagogues. Uh, if you had such a person that was motivated in that way, what would each of you say to them? Mm, I mean, hate, hate doesn't solve any of our problems, and you know, an eye for an eye. Um, I would say to, to not use this as a platform for anti-Semitism or Islamophobia, to see this as a time to come together for peace mm -hmm. and humanity yeah. and not see it as one side or the other. To love one another, <laughs> I mean, so cliche, but really, yeah. just more love, less fighting. I mean, we raise our kids that way, right? They start knocking each other around. You say, that's not gonna solve anything. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the children of today are looking to our, you know, government, our president, mm -hmm. our political leaders, and saying, wait, doesn't this go against everything that 
we're being taught to tolerate, to coexist, to love, to treat each other with respect. I mean, we have so many platforms going on. I do feel the younger generation's more willing to relate and understand that. But then as adults, we're supposed to be leaders and examples. And mm -hmm. sometimes I think, what kind of an example are we being to the youth? It's, it's heartbreaking. Like, we're using force. Yeah. We're using machines to kill mm. and yeah. thinking that that's going to solve. Well, I think being an example, uh, mm. both of you have done that and been that. And I thank both of you for being a part of this program and helping uh, get observations out there, some added information, and perhaps some motivation for people to look at how they're reacting and what they can do to help. So thank you both very thank much. You, thank Jeff. you for thank having you. us. And thank you very much for tuning into this episode of Challenge 2.0. We hope you'll join us again next week. If you've enjoyed this program, found our conversations to be informative, entertaining, and thought-provoking, and the vision inspiring of people from different backgrounds who can disagree without being disagreeable, perhaps you might consider supporting our program with a contribution. Your support will not only help our program continue, it will also support the broader efforts of past understanding, our supporting parent nonprofit organization.